this is Lama Tantrapa, and I want to thank you for your interest in the secrets of Qigong Masters. You are at the right place if you want to learn from some of the best experts in our field how to tap into the energy resources that will help you achieve greater vitality, personal power, improve the quality of your life, and experience self-realization. I encourage you to dive deeper into these teachings by exploring the additional resources provided by this and other amazing guests of our show. Please visit QigongMasters.com where you'll find a treasure trove of information and materials dedicated to empowering you to live your dreams. Today, I'm delighted to reintroduce to you Mark Johnson, who is a world-renowned expert in Qigong, the proud owner of Qigong.com website, and the creator of numerous Tai Chi DVDs, including Tai Chi for seniors, Tai Chi for women, and Tai Chi for movie stars. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, so healing. Mark, please uh, share with us your knowledge and wisdom on uh, uh, the subject of uh, sexual energetics. Well, as I've always said, I would rather do it than talk about it, <laughs> first of all. I Taoist energetics started in 1974. When I went to China, met my teacher, great teacher, talked him into coming to this country, and then uh, I was trained under his very strict old methods. You know, kick you out three times, and and then uh, you know make you work incessantly, nonstop. But then if you're still there after six or seven years of that, then you start getting the goodies. And I'd already read the, the books on sexuality by Montag Chi and a lot of other people and, um, and even tantric books. And I still haven't found anybody that had the insight that he had. And because he maintained that his family bamboo strips go back to the Han Dynasty. So he had a direct source from way back then that he was drawing upon. So I thought I got special instruction and... Um, and I went out and taught it for quite a while, and everybody seemed to like it. Uh, if we look at uh, the Taoist sexuality in general, and uh, sexual energetics in particular, um, what is your uh, definition, what's your understanding of this uh, approach to sexuality as an as aspect of human life, as compared to ordinary humans addressing the same subject matter? For most people... Sex is uh, itch, itch scratching, and um, it's usually done by two carcasses, you know, uh, banging themselves together in the middle of the night in a frantic uh, attempt to eke out a little pleasure in their otherwise meaningless lives of uh, stress and depression. <laughs> so that's my impression of uh, Western Taoist sexuality. Now, the Chinese, it's always been. Um, procreation, and then to the West, it's always been a sin. <laughs> so everybody had their own perspective on the, on the subject. And, uh, and there are so many Chinese in China. They were really focusing on procreation. Yeah, that suddenly paid off for them, didn't it? Yeah, people all over the place. And the Western medicine has paid off in that everybody, uh, you know, regards it as a sin, so they're psychologically screwed up and... Uh, you know, you need it, and, you, and yet it's, it's sinful for the most part. And they're, they get all kind of repressed subconscious content about it. It's just a, a mess. Well, China is also extremely sexually repressed society. And uh, with the exception of perhaps a handful of Taoists, the majority of people uh, grew up in that country experience one degree of uh, sexual repression or another. And uh, apparently not all Chinese are Taoists, so we have to look at a very specific, perhaps a, a fraction of that particular society that has a little bit of understanding of what sexuality can be if it's approached from a different perspective, not procreation and not sin. So what is the alternative way of looking at sexuality? That it can be a conduit to the divine and that the... Uh, the combination of the women's water yin energy is completely compatible and needed by the uh, yang fire energy. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you ever do the fire, you uh, 
you boil the water and the water dissipates, and if you have too much water, it puts a fire out. So anything in extreme, one or the other, is uh, is not going to work. So you have to find a balance between the two, and um, that can be fun. <laughs> but with that balance, it can uh, supply both the male and the female with the dimensions that they weren't capable of by themselves. So I found it very useful in my life, and I practiced it. Um, very seriously, and my motto is, uh, you know, if you don't have the uh, oneness of the universe experience from it right off the bat, try, try again. <laughs> so, I was very diligent about it. It's one of the few things I was most diligent about with my Taoist training. And, and it paid off after a while. Um, what became a chore for a goal just became a very relaxed, playful, um, experience of uniting the two, the yin and the yang between the two bodies and running it through the do my and rin my channels of each one with the breathing coordinated. The man on the bottom, because according to the I Ching, the, you know, the male energy should be on the bottom. All the good hexagrams have the yang energy at the bottom because it tends to rise and the top the, the yin energy tends to sink. So the most encouraging and, uh, Productive I Ching hexagrams are where the yang energy is on the bottom rising and the female can, and the ones that are the worst are when they're upside down. The man's going up, the woman's going down, and there's no connection. So there are many examples in Chinese uh, history where they recognize the importance of the male energy on the bottom. And so that's the first thing I learned is that you get on the bottom, the man, because it makes for a better flow. So once you figure out the position, you are at the bottom, then yeah. what, or how do you practice any type of uh, energy practices? In other words, if we're talking about uh, the Taoist practice, for example, called clouds and rain, or tantric practices, um, what does the practice really consist of, and also what are the benefits of it? When I was setting a little tantra, which I feel had a, like, like, um, Taoist sexuality, it, it had very lofty ideals and a lot more power to it in the old days. But in both cases, the Tantra and the Taoist sexuality, they both degenerated into, you know, screwing for God, you know, or uh, as the Buddhists call it, screwing for the benefit of all mankind. <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah, but it was a, a way of appeasing some of their guilt that they had learned in the Sunday schools. And, uh, and you know, I grew up through the 60s, the, uh, you know, the love, the free love era. I was never sure it was worth it, <laughs> all that free love was worth it or not. And, um, and I feel sorry for people that are limited to a genital orgasm. I really do. It's pathetic. Uh, once you have some of these uh, incredible unit of experiences from the sex act with uh, a partner that has strong energy in, in themselves, it's uh, it just dwarfs uh, or you know genital orgasm, and it's like oh god, um, you poor dear, you are only capable, of, <laughs> you know, or physical orgasm limited to the genitals, so. That's the way I feel about that. But anyway, if they ask you to get more detailed, the, and I experimented with a lot of different methods. And the ones that the, I kept coming back to were where, I mean, you know, in, in the old Chinese books, and, you know, I, I can uh, read that stuff, or I used to be able to. I'm losing it. Uh, it was like a combat. <laughs> between two armies. He's going to hold back and she's going to suck his chi out of you. It was like it was mortal combat. It was disgusting. But anyway, as the, as the dynasties flowed on, they, they dropped a little bit of the sex as uh, bedroom warfare into uh, a way to cooperate and share and, and, and know how to nourish each other better and more efficiently and effectively. So I slowly zeroed in on what I experienced as that greatest combination of sharing of energies and using them so that both can go higher than either one can go individually. There's three main levels 
of oriental sex. There's the um, plugged-in genital sexual uh, original stimulant. Then there's the um, body contact without the sexual part at all. And then there's the part where you don't even have to touch the other person. You can be in the same room and exchange the energy, even at a much higher frequency. Uh, all of being is just energy of different frequencies. And everybody I know wants out of the gross frequency and wants into the heaven frequency. It's just up and out. That's, you know, that's Buddhism in a nutshell. It's Christianity. It's almost all of it. Except the Taoists, they're sitting around drinking wine, having a good time, <laughs> enjoy, enjoying the gross, the gross frequency, which is, you know, play. It, that level can be a playground. And then the, the high, next highest frequency, which is um, the realm of um, the mind and creativity and so forth, uh, is another playground. And it's a much more refined uh, frequency. And then there's the highest one, which is so fast in its frequency, it almost feels like complete stillness. And, uh, and it utterly contains all the others. And it's just and it's just um, the way things are. <laughs> so there you have the three frequencies. But everybody wants the high frequency only. Those idiots, they know that they don't know that it can't be done. Because in the West, you know, the Western gods say oh, the light will win over the dark and good will overcome evil and thousands of years of perfection. It's just nonsense. It can't be done. They're ignoring yin yang, which. You don't say yin and yang because they can't be separated. Have you ever heard of yin and yang theory? Hell no, it's all yin yang theory. So they can't be separated. And if you start wanting only this and try to skew this, you're going to end up a manic depressive, manic depressive, manic depressive. Now here's what a Tao, here's what a sage is like, like looks like, just like that general curving wave like that, not too high, not too low. This, these, you know, Goldilocks. Uh, zone, you might say, uh, but not Americans, uh, too much is not enough, and oh, we, and then, oh, hell, how did I get down here, and we, and how did I get down here, manic, depressive, manic, depressive, we're nuts, we're all crazy, but nobody ar nobody even argues that anymore, <laughs> so why do we continue? So I wonder if um, you mentioned that uh, uh, there are certain realms uh, that become available to you if you engage in the uh, tantric sexual practices that may not be available to you by yourself if you only sure. do solo practices. Now, what kind of realms are those and how come uh, that it's impossible to achieve those realms or achieve those uh, states of being uh, just through solo practice? Uh, from my experience, uh, I was able to go through solo practice after 40 years. Uh, but it was a lot speeded up when I had a partner in doing it that way. So I'm, I'm not claiming you can't do it solo. There's lots of monks all over the, through history that manage. Uh, it just takes longer, and um, it can be speeded up by the... Uh, the balance and the extra power of the other person merging with yours. So I wouldn't say you can't have it without it. It just speeds up the process. And I'm, I'm impatient by nature. Patience just isn't one of my many, many virtues, <laughs> is all I can say. God, I hate to wait for anything. So those realms that you mentioned that can be achieved uh, after 40 years of solo practice but can be sped up uh, to achieve a lot quicker uh, what are those realms exactly? Uh, well, it's where I reside half the time because I like all three realms, so I just kind of vacillate between the three. But I I have access to it, and a lot of that came from the dual cultivation, where the energy uh, is is uh, breathe inhaled up your spine, over your head, down your front, and then with your mind following it. See what I mean? Your mind's eye your mind's eye is going with it. And then it goes out the penis and up into the woman's back. That's when she inhales it up her back and then exhales it down her front while I'm mentally following where it is in her. And then when it hits me, you can feel it and it starts going up you and then I inhale 
held very, it held very strongly and exhales strongly down and out and up in her. And then she takes over and inhales it up and down in me. And you and you keep doing that till it builds up and it gets quite strong and, and you, your body starts vibrating. And then at that point, after 10 years, I figured out, not even figured out, it's in the book. I figured out enough to, then you relax and let it go itself. See what I mean? As long as it's a chore and if you're working for a goal, it's okay, but it's just uh, uh, a crude way to go about it. You'll find that if you get the process started, it'll start growing on its own and do all the work itself. You just sit back and you become empty and open. And then, and then it really, the two bodies get, I've, it's only happened to me a couple of times because of the people I were with, you know, at different levels and so forth. What happened is, uh, and, and both of us are saying the same things, so we both had the same experiences too, is that it, it gets stronger and stronger and faster and faster without you doing anything, and all of a sudden it will blow out the top of your heads, and then your consciousness and, and hers starts connecting, and you start understanding each other at that, that level, that where the, the energy of both of us is kind of together. And then so you know them to their depths, and then they know you, and then you kind of both branch out together and include more and more and so forth. And it's an incredible experience, and, uh, and, and that was the foundation of me doing it myself now. I'm doing a Qigong exercise called the Heart of the Cosmos, which is, deals with the thrusting channel itself. And my teacher had a hole in his head then when I met him. That's the first thing I noticed when, when we ran into him. And um, I said, hey, how's going to get a hole up there? And he said, well, he said the... Uh, That's why we call him the holy man. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. And uh, he cultivated it. And there's a thrusting channel. It goes out the mud pill, M-U-D-P-I-L. The mud pill is a Chinese term for it. And if the thrusting channel is directed through that, enough times it will soften it and there'll be a, it, your your head will concave down which mine is slightly now i'm hot but his was a freak in the hole or a, seemed like it anyway that that's where i uh, slowly um through this new style of qigong that i woke up with every morning it was a combination of several see he has an earth style a, a human style and a, a cosmic style and in them were the seeds of each other. And I figured out how to put them together in my heart of the cosmos style. So I did. And I kept waking up every morning with a new idea. And I'd come running out and, and I, there would be spirals according to the Fibonacci series. You know, spirals are nature's way that that does things. You know, I always wanted to know how does nature work and, uh, and why does it do it that way? And I found out, holy God, there's... The, the, the Fibonacci series is found in seashells and in plants and sunflower seeds. And uh, so anyway, so I started imitating, imitating the Fibonacci series. And then uh, Tauruses, uh, Tauruses are everywhere. They're around atoms and, and people. And the earth has a Taurus around it, the magnetic flow. And the galaxies have it around because of the black holes. See what I mean? These are fundamental principles of nature that if you imitate them, you, you elicit a uh, resonance. It, the, all of that will start resonating with you and giving up its secrets and opening you up to it and it to you. So I run around with light beings half the time, and then I come back to these fat-ass waddling mammals around here, <laughs> you know, sloshing around and bags of fluids, stagnant fluids just sloshing around, you know. And knee deep in fructose and corn syrup, you know, complaining about how screwed up the world is. Oh my God! Well, anyway, once you're out there with these high frequency beings, and and everything is kind of mental telepathy, you don't really, and it isn't even words. You just kind of know what they're getting at, and they know what you're getting at. And they always say, "We don't get too many visitors from your planet." <laughs> I can see why. Oh my God! It's like, whew. Right. Uh, I have a question about um, the parallels and perhaps also distinctions between Taoist sexual energetics as opposed to tantric. You mentioned that you've practiced both. Perhaps you can uh, give our viewers a little bit of an idea 
I did, but I'm no expert on it, and uh, I don't want to imply that I did. And the reason I'm no expert on it is because I gave up on it uh, fairly quickly because I saw that it was just too... That was the 60s, when everybody was into just free sex and that kind of stuff, and it, and it uh, made everything... It enhanced just genital sex. So I kind of... I, I gave up on it. So I'm no expert in it, but I feel that the, the ancient... Tantra was the same thing that I had kind of discovered about the Chinese sexual practices. It was a very deep way of, of combining energies and both of them benefiting from that and increasing their sphere of being through that. So I suspect it was that way, but I found it too, too um, spectacular, too genital related, too orgasmic. Um, all that kind of stuff. So I dropped it in a hurry. And there's a lot of uh, Chinese sexuality, you know, a lot of uh, Taoist sexual books that I've read that I didn't particularly like too well. You know, you're you're holding the seam and in constantly, and, and she's trying to get it, and you know, that kind of stuff. So it's degenerated. They both degenerated. I'm hoping that, or I would like to think that I have rediscovered what it was all about in that it was a sharing and, a, and a, an enlargement of the energies and your scope of being, and, and wow. And now um, I spend half my time, no, not half, a little time every hour day. See, time's different everywhere you go. And, and you know, a lot of times when I uh, go out, uh, and it is, I don't have it under control like my teacher did. He could come and go at will. And he only came and went for a good reason. Okay. Well, you, just a few minutes ago, you were saying that uh, those people who are just constantly striving to get to this uh, high frequency uh, level of vibration, yeah, are totally. missing the boat because they are not embracing the gross frequencies. And mm -hmm. just now, you're saying that you feel kind of gross about yourself because when you're dealing with the light beings they are operating at much higher frequency. So are you embracing your gross frequency and uh, uh, happy with it or not quite? It's, it's another playground is the way I look at it. Uh, and uh, I have as much fun as anybody I know here with other people. Uh, and, but um, it's, it's, it's very, it's limited in what... Uh, what you, it's limited in who you think you are. And uh, so, yes, I have, I have both of the, you asked kind of an either or question, and I'm saying they're both true. Uh, I still have a lot of fun here, I have a lot of fun. And yet, um, it just, ugh. it's like ice cube, water, and steam. They're all H2O, and and, you know, uh, this realm, to have a lot of fun, the two ice cubes bang into each other sexually. Bang, bang, bang. One, one ice cube has a little projection and the other has a little hole and they bang around. And bang, two ice cubes banging together. That's fun, you know? Okay, it can be fun sometimes. And, and then, then uh, the next frequency, it's all water. So we're interpenetrated anyway. So you don't really have to do anything. We can interpenetrate with each other. And that's pretty exciting, too. And then up there, it's like steam. It's like, wow, steam is invisible. I don't know if you know that. Uh, you can't see steam. You see condensation. When the, when the hot steam hits the air, it makes water. So con steam is so powerful and such a, high, such a high heat and energy that it can't be seen. And it's kind of like them. Not them, but it. That frequency is very, it's it's so, such a high frequency, it's stillness, complete, utter stillness. And it's just, uh, oh, yeah, that's me. I, I, I didn't know this was part of me until it is. And then, wow. And so, and you, you know, when you feel like it, you go there. Or if you get called to go there, you go there. But, um, but it is true. I must admit that's a... Uh, uh, that's the uh, frequency uh, I like the best, but I actually enjoy them all. <clears throat> and I'm not afraid to come down here or even hesitant to come to this frequency. What are you describing is that uh, 
uh, the, the sexual practices as well as the practices of uh, uh, solo meditation and qigong uh, yeah, can be yeah. extremely yeah. rich in terms of spiritual meaning and uh, perhaps transcendental or at least transpersonal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, is there such a thing as a sexual healing? So in other words, uh, is there any uh, healing component to the Taoist uh, sexual energetics? Oh, there are entire books on that. Uh, Taoist sexuality uh, for healing specific illnesses, something like that. So screwing in different positions to heal different... Uh... Well, uh, the idea about uh, sexual healing is probably also that it heals some of the sexual blockages or hang-ups or uh, certain stereotypes that uh, prevent people from experiencing uh, sexuality fully, but also perhaps affect uh, our health adversely and maybe also ruin relationships or make the person psychologically unfit. Mm -hmm. so, I got it. So I just I, never, uh, I was never unhealthy, so I didn't have to. But I, I practiced what was in the book with some friends I had, so uh, that's all I did. That's the furthest I got. And I can't even remember the name of the book. But um, the, some people did get some cures from that, as I recall. Um, so it has its it has its place. I see. Well, um, something that perhaps you uh, will know better than me and, and most of our viewers, how does uh, a sexual practice specifically a Taoist sexual practice, a change with age? Uh, I can only speak for myself. Um, and it changed with me in that um, I don't even have a great desire for the highest level anymore. You know what I mean? If someone comes along and wants to practice it, uh, I'm, all, I'm all for it. But my, my need for... Uh, Oh, I lost my need for general sex a long time ago. Um, and I haven't orgasmed in, you know, four or five years, I guess. Uh, and, and it's not from repression. It's just that I just got carried away with the other frequencies so damn much that I can't be bothered. Anyway, and I'm not opposed to it. I just I kind of forgot about it. And um, <laughs> it, it, it's just... You know that uh, some people uh, experience certain challenges... Uh, as they get older, for example, men experience uh, erectile dysfunction. Women also go through menopause and have their own issues. So um, you may kind of have your own experience or perhaps a, a deeper understanding of uh, uh, perhaps different levels of uh, uh, engagement and also uh, benefits of sexual practices at different stages of life. Oh, now that you mentioned it, I'm sure they were different. They were satisfying different needs at every level, at every age. You could see, you know, I was doing this at one time, and then I did this the next time, and then it was this, and that was this, and that was this. And then it was integrating all of them, and expansion of my being changed. Boy, what a change that was. And, uh, and, and we're all, we're all uh, capable of this. Uh, we're all the totality. We're all the ocean. We're identifying, and, and we're a wave. We're a wave in the ocean and the totality of the ocean. And, you know, the, the beginning stages are like two little waves getting together. You know what I mean? But after a while, that lost its meaning. Went, holy, I'm the whole ocean. So it's like I don't quite do that as much as I used to anymore. Um, and it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just a, a, a kind of a natural evolution, I would say. And... And so too many people, when they hit the, the, the ocean stage, they poo-poo, and I, it sounds like I poo-pooed a little bit, not much. The waves are so fascinating, uh, all of them, and, uh, and what they do is interesting. The ocean just is, just is, and it's there, and it's everywhere. It's like, I could see that could very easily get boring. It hasn't gotten boring yet, but... Uh, the totality needs some excitement. So it just makes waves and everybody's a different wave. And, and I kept asking my teacher, how did he know such people on a deep level? He said, I just dive down into my wave and pop up in that wave and experience myself as them and then come back. And then I would uh, have a sense of how to help them and all that kind of stuff. 
So we're all waves, and um, and I went from the uh, one wave, uh, you know, having sex with another, and then uh, that didn't wasn't too satisfying, and then uh, so forth. And and I'm, I'm still not out of that second sphere. And the third one is somewhat scary. I mean, you go out there and you, it's a different time zone and beings. It's like, whoa, you, you, you can't go with a lot of fear. So you better get rid of your fear before you get into four and fifth dimensions and uh, different time zone. One time I set my alarm for seven and and uh, I woke up, looked up. I woke up and I said, what time is it? Uh, Ten minutes till seven. So I put it back and I went back like this. And I went off to some place I spent weeks there talking to these beings. Uh, you don't talk to them exactly. It's more like mental telepathy. And they were explaining stuff to me and I was having a good time. And all of a sudden my alarm went off. Ten minutes had gone by and I'd spent weeks out there. See what I mean? That's weird. And, um, and that's what you have to look forward to when you really... Uh, Take this sexual thing seriously and and uh, expand your being because of it uh, in, in a fun way. It's a fun way to expand your being, and you're and you're with someone else. They're also participating in it. That doesn't get any better than that. Well, you, you <clears throat> actually just uh, brought up uh, the, the kind of intersection between the tantra yoga or uh, Taoist sexual practices on one hand and. Uh, uh, the dream yoga or uh, the lucid dreaming practices on the other hand or supposedly you were lucid uh, to awake be awake in the dream that uh, you said lasted several weeks while yeah. it only take it took 10 minutes uh, in the mechanical time so to speak yeah. uh, so there's an interesting intersection between uh, the two practices the sexual practices of tantra and the uh, uh, more or less solo practices in dream yoga. But there are also dream yoga practices that are like dual cultivation. For example, uh, in Tibetan and Buddhist traditions and uh, uh, several other traditions uh, throughout the world, uh, there is a practice of kind of imagining a, an imaginary friend. Uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhist yeah. terminology, it's uh, referred to as the Dakini, uh, or like a sky dancer. And yeah. that essentially yeah. serves as an imaginary friend who you can not only enjoy company of, but also learn a great deal from. Have you ever experienced anything like that? I uh, will explain it a little bit more, and then I can tell you better. Uh, give me an example. So, for example, uh, uh, some of the uh, masters of uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditation uh, would visualize, like manifesting, an imaginary friend of the opposite sex who would appear in their retreat or in, in their cave or wherever they were, and who would come to them and would uh, either entertain them or uh, teach them certain things, or perhaps engage in some sexual practices. And many of those uh, Tibetan masters were either celibate or they were basically living by themselves in, in a retreat, and so they would not have anybody to practice these practices with. So. Essentially, uh, the uh, dream being, the dream character who would show up in their dreams would basically uh, get them involved in the practice of uh, uh, sexual energetics in the dream state. That's kind of an interesting combination of uh, 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 dream practice and the tantric practice uh, integrated into one. I, I haven't had that experience, but it's certainly... Uh... Sounds interesting. <laughs> well, don't get me started. I'll be doing that now. That'll be my next little project. But it uh, certainly sounds viable to me. The only thing of uh, my experience with uh, lucid dreaming is that too many people that were in it were going into the dreams and they were aware of their dream, and they would manipulate the damn dream the way they wanted it to be. And I feel our dreams are full of uh, solutions, and they're working on solutions, and then the you know, it's um, uh, uh, they're too eager to get a happy ending. You know, they manipulate the dream and they don't get the message of the dream. That's my biggest complaint with uh, people that do that, and why I didn't take it more seriously. But I don't know a thing about it, so that's all I can say. <laughs> well, definitely, when people experience lucid dreams, 
which means they find themselves in the dream and they realize that they are dreaming, they can, if they really want to, uh, manipulate things or uh, affect the flow of the dream. But often they re don't realize that there is a profound reason why the dream flows the way it does. So yeah, in other words, when they try that. to manipulate the flow of the dream, they actually interfere into uh, the underlying uh, root causes of why this dream is flowing this way, and perhaps they don't understand why the root causes were uh, orchestrating the development of the scenario in a certain way. They want it to go in some other way. And so basically, they think that they're going to get something good for them or for whoever. Right. And, and it's all dependent, of course, on what they believe good thing is. And, of course, often we know that what's good today may not be good tomorrow. Or uh, sure. what one right. person thinks good it may not be good for another person. So basically it's very subjective. And often when people expect that something good is going to happen, they set themselves up for disappointment or failure. Or even if they do get it, mm -hmm. uh, then what? Well, they got what they wanted. Now you yeah. basically end up like a dog with an air bus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you just said a lot better than what I just said five minutes ago, but it's identical. <laughs> we were saying the same thing. Oh, you said a hell of a lot better. Uh, I would say, so I agree with that. And, and it's like in life. And, and uh, the reason I wasn't too excited about going into dreams and manipulating is because I've slowly learned that in the, in the fable, uh, some of my... Uh, Cancer patients, when I was, you know, into acupuncture and that sort of thing, said getting cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was on the surface of life. I was married to a rich guy and I was shopping all the time. And then I got cancer and I thought oh, the worst thing, oh my God, this is horrible. I'm losing everything I have, the house and the kids. And, the, and then they said, but then I realized how how surface my life was, and now that the end's pretty coming close, I got more uh, involved only with things of, of consequence. So see what I mean? That's, that's like the dream thing. Uh, uh, you know, you you put a happy ending, but you've missed what the pain that was you were just about to experience in the dream. A little bit of pain, a little bit of discomfort. Americans won't satisfy. Or, you know, won't allow either one of them. No discomfort, no pain, because I got a pill I can take that you won't feel either one of them. Of course, I'll you know, live like a zombie, but that's another story. Anyway, so, I, so I'm also agreeing with you that uh, uh, most, most people don't know what is good for them, and they go after what they want rather than what they need, and uh, the dream is of trying to bring about what they need and <laughs> just ruin the whole damn thing by manipulating it the way they want it. And um, I see it in Americans' lives constantly, that uh, this generation, of, uh, and it, it's worse now. And uh, just I mean, my God, look at our politics. Uh, just the other day I was uh, in this uh, heated discussion with uh, another <laughs> Qigong teacher who was advocating that the Taoists are not really into just being natural. They actually want to manipulate things. They want to direct things according to what they think is right because they know better than what's natural. And of mm. course, I could only smile to that because it seemed like when the person figured out when, what is better than natural, mm -hmm. usually the nature is going to turn things around and uh, just show them that natural is basically usually the best experience or best approach. If you look at uh, how people practice Qigong, often they try to control Qi, manipulate it, direct it where they think it should go, mm -hmm. or cultivate it in whatever other way. Mm -hmm. How does that compare to what you just described, your approach to dream, and I just extrapolate and apply it to life in general, where you address the flow of the dream by trusting it that it knows where to flow and allow it to flow wherever it needs to. Can it be applied to the practice of Qigong in our daily lives? What is your take on the juxtaposition of following nature and just pursuing uh, the harmony with the natural flow of things, like in the dream, as opposed to manipulating things according to what you consider is right or, or important or necessary?
Yes. Uh, but, and unfortunately, most people need to go through that interim, I want to feel good stage until the pain builds up to where that's not satisfying anymore. Then they're willing to look beyond. It's like you can't talk an alcoholic out of stopping drinking till he's hit bottom. And then he's more receptive and then he gets out of it. So I regard pain as a great liberator and a great portal to um, uh, what you really need. And uh, so uh, it's a blessing, for God's sake, uh, to some extent. And uh, I wish more people would have that attitude. I remember a couple of years ago you, you mentioned to me uh, in private conversation that you take it personally if somebody is in pain around you. And you don't let them be in pain so basically, there was uh, some kind of discussion that we had about how you heal people from pain. And now you're saying that pain actually would be a blessing in disguise. So oh, it, it can be. And um, uh, yeah, I'm saying it can be uh, a blessing in disguise. And, but, and, and it is true. I'm not sure I said I... Uh, what, what I did was in those days was I took on what it was, and it took me a long time to not do that anymore. And what they were feeling, I would end up feeling. Uh, you know, when I was working with the showbiz people, it was 75 people a day, and they were all drugged out of their minds at the times, and, uh, and, I, and I felt like black tar going up my arms, you know, and I would just absorb whatever the hell their problem was. And I was getting knocked around quite a bit for the first couple of weeks. But then something clicked, and um, and I was able to uh, uh, not take on their symptoms. And uh, and at the end of the day, working with them, I was energized by the whole thing instead of being completely depleted. And it just happened naturally. That's <laughs> all I can say. Out of sheer desperation, you know, the, you know what they say, uh, necessity is a mother or something like that. <laughs> and uh, so out of sheer necessity my being said hey we got to figure out how to do this without being depleted and taking on their symptoms and being exhausted at the end of the day and after 75 people I'd be running around still full of energy because uh, it was flowing down through me to them and I, so I was getting some of the goodies while I was going out and that's what saved me, and it wasn't, I, it wasn't anything I worked at. I mean, I knew I needed to learn it somehow, and it just did it out of desperation, I think. Interesting. So what you're describing right now sounds almost like Reiki, essentially uh, channeling energy uh, through you uh, rather than a Qigong where you uh, condense energy or cultivate it or direct it according to uh, your specific protocols or techniques. So, have you ever studied Reiki? No. I, anybody that calls themselves a master after a weekend course, I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. So I never looked at it. And they seem kind of simplistic anyway. And, you know, I'm a Reiki master. I was like, oh, give me a break. And uh, so, and it could be, for all I know, I too summarily dismiss them. But the idea of Reiki, as far as I understand, and again, uh, I'm not a uh, master of Reiki, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the idea is that you tap into the divine energy that flows through everything and mm -hmm. just simply become a conduit for it rather yeah. than uh, uh, trying to manipulate or control or direct. You just simply let it flow and do its thing and mm -hmm. you don't interfere so much. Basically, get out of the, the way. That's what happened to me, so I guess I'm a Reiki at heart. So I'm going to start calling myself a Reiki master now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, to wrap up our exploration Ooh. of uh, sexual energetics today, what would you say about application of sexual energetics to other spheres of life? For example, I know that some people, let's say, boost their creativity with uh, uh, sexual energetic practices. Uh, what can you say or what, what do you know about that and what can you share with us? I have no doubt that it can uh, be channeled to any aspect of your life that you want, that you need energy for, more energy for, and a balanced energy if you do it right. So anytime you increase your energy and it's balanced, you can use it for anything you want. 
And I use it to just blow out to the edge of the universe. So I'm just a big boring ocean just laying there not doing anything anymore. <laughs> so I identify with my little wave every now and then for the fun of it. So that's what happened. That's what I used it for. But, uh, you know, I know people that did it strictly to get rid of a disease where that book I told you, you know, where I was, you know, no, no, your right foot has to be over here and you have to be on top and you're over here. <laughs> I did it with a bunch of people trying to cure a particular thing and it probably did. I don't know. I don't remember. So there, all I'm saying is, yes, the, the sexual, the sexual uh, energy can be used for anything. Hangnail, you can cure a hangnail with it, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, and yet you could blow out to the, the to what is, <clears throat> and um, so it's all available. Have fun, do it, and take advantage of it. And, uh, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> That's a good way to end it, I would say. You have finished another episode of the talk show, The Secrets of Qigong Masters, that brings to you some of the top experts in Qigong, meditation, healing, and martial arts. Now I invite you to visit qigongmasters.com and dive deeper into the teachings of our amazing guests by downloading their multimedia products and becoming a member of our international community of like-minded people. The show is also brought to you by Catherine of Chidao, offering qigong coaching programs that integrate the ancient energy arts with the modern methodology of coaching. If you struggle with chronic pain, suffer from too much stress, want to boost your performance, or seek spiritual awakening, please go to qigongcoaching.com. There, you can receive top-notch coaching as well as professional training to become a certified qigong coach yourself. That's right. If you're dreaming of making a decent living, doing what you love, and making a difference in the lives of many people worldwide, check out our programs that will help you transform your interest in energy arts into living your life in the flow. 